Thank you, Seth, and good morning. It's good to see all of you. I know this is where I want to be, so and I trust it is for all of you. We're continuing our studies in 1 Peter. We're in chapter 2, and this morning we're going to look at verses 6 through 10. Last week, in verse 5, Peter commented or wrote that, uh, that we are a spiritual house. We're God's temple, and we are a holy priesthood. Great privileges that we have. And now he supports that. He gives the evidence of that in verses 6 through 10 with a number of citations from the Old Testament. He says, for this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. That word doom is, as you notice, uh, added as an interpretation of the word this. So I'll come back to that in the lesson. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The great blessings that those persecuted saints had and are the blessings that we also share with them in Christ. Let's bow in a word of prayer. In the 1962 British epic movie, or Lawrence of Arabia, there's an important scene when Lawrence and his Arab companion complete a deadly trek across the Sinai Desert. They stand on the verge of the Suez Canal. Lawrence is dressed in the garb of an Arab prince covered in dust when a British soldier on a motorcycle rides by on the other side of the canal. Lawrence's companion signals to the soldier for help. He stopped and called out, Who are you? There's silence from Lawrence. He called out again, Who are you? No answer. I call that an important scene because in the movie, that was Lawrence's problem. He didn't know who he was or where he belonged, an Arab or an Englishman. Now, the T.E. Lawrence of history was more grounded than the one in the movie, but I think the question is relevant for Christians today. Who are you? What are you to be doing? Those are important questions. And, and we, we can't function usefully if we don't know who we are and what we are to be doing. And we might find that a lot of Christians can't answer those questions with any certainty. Who are you? You are a priest. A priest of God Almighty. There is no more important privileged position in all the world. What are you to be doing? Priestly work and glorifying God. These are the answers Peter gives us in our passage. He's already stated in verse 5 that we are a holy priesthood. In verse 9, he calls us a royal priesthood. Then he gave the reasons for this great privilege and blessing. 
so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you. That's our great goal or purpose or chief end in life. The Shorter Catechism famously put it very simply and clearly and correctly. It is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And as Peter has already explained, we are well positioned and well equipped to do that. In verse 5, he stated that we are God's temple. When we came to Christ, whom he described as a living stone, we became as living stones, part of God's temple, but also priests in his temple. That word, that would have, um, that would have been a great encouragement to these downtrodden, persecuted saints. They were persecuted because they were Christians. They were persecuted because they had come to Christ. But what they had come to was an unimaginable blessing. Solomon was amazed when he built his temple that God would condescend to dwell among his people. Here we're told that we are part of his temple. So they hadn't given up anything in coming to Christ. They had gained everything. They were God's temple. God dwelt in them. And they were His priests. That is really an amazing thing. Now some might say, yeah, that is an amazing thing. Prove it. So now in verses 6 through 10, Peter does just that. He supports his teaching and encouragement with several Old Testament quotations. They have been called stone prophecies. He introduced them by saying, For this is contained in Scripture. In other words, the Old Testament is the evidence for his bold claims about our position and our privilege. And that is conclusive proof. There's no greater proof nor higher authority than the one he gives, which is Scripture. One of the watchwords of the Reformation became Scripture alone. This is one of the five onlys. And it is listed first because only Scripture, only Scripture is our final authority. And if we don't have Scripture, we can't know that the other four are true. We can't know that it is salvation by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. Those are all true, but we can't know they're true if we don't have Scripture to teach us and prove it. Now that's not just the Reformers. That's the apostles. Peter's authority for what he taught here is based on God's Word, as all our beliefs must be. Not feelings or general consensus, certainly not tradition. Scripture alone. Peter then quoted from Isaiah 28, verse 6, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, that is a, a prophecy of judgment on the leaders of Jerusalem. A prophecy that God would sweep them away and would establish a permanent foundation for a better temple and better service. He would lay a cornerstone. Now that's an important stone. It is the, the first one laid as the corner of the foundation of a building. And the fact that this stone would be laid in Zion, the place where the Jerusalem temple was, indicated that it would replace the temple and replace its priesthood. Peter indicated that back in verses 4 and 5, but this is the scriptural proof for it. It's a, a very different temple from the stone structure that Solomon built and then the stone structure and grand structure that Herod built. This is a spiritual temple. In one sense, it is Christ. 
And I say that because in John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, he said that. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. And then John explains, he's not speaking of that stone temple, he was speaking of the temple of his body. And earlier, John wrote, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, meaning he tabernacled among us literally. And we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Christ is the tabernacle or temple of God. And since the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was given and the church began, we too are His temple because we are joined to Christ. Today you can visit Jerusalem and go to the western wall, the Wailing Wall, and you can see the religious Jews crowded before it, praying, praying earnestly. It's all that's left of the second temple. It's not actually the temple proper. It's the western part of the wall that surrounded the temple. But you get a sense from it of the grandeur that structure had with its massive and finely cut stones. But as great as it was, it could not compare to the glory of the present temple of Christ's body, the church. The temple was temporary. That one was, as Solomon's was. And it's all gone. Only a few ruins remain. But the church is eternal. It can never be destroyed. Not even the gates of hell will prevail against it. Christ is the cornerstone. And Peter and Isaiah promised that all who come to Him, all who believe in Him, all those who build their lives on Him and go through difficulties and are rejected by the world, all of those will not be disappointed or put to shame, embarrassed. Now, they may be rejected by men. They might be persecuted as a result of believing in Christ. But ultimately, the faith, our faith, will be vindicated. And there will be no disappointment in Christ. All that we have gone through, all that we have suffered, will be as nothing compared to the glory that follows and the reward that follows. In fact, in verse 7, Peter promises, promises us value or honor. Literally, the Greek text is, for you, therefore, who believe is the honor. There's no greater honor than to be joined to Jesus Christ to be friends of the King of Kings, ruler of the universe, who, as the author of Hebrews said, is not ashamed to call us brethren. And through faith and faith alone, not merit on our part, but by God's grace alone, we have believed in Him and we are joined to Him. Participate in Christ's life. Have a part in His ministry. That's the honor. But, what is an encouragement for believers is at the same time a warning for unbelievers. Because the one whom they rejected is vindicated and exalted by God. The stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. Not the capstone, meaning the top stone as the New International Version has it. The word is literally the head of the corner. It refers to the first stone laid for the foundation. The cornerstone gives direction, gives proportion to the rest of the foundation and to the whole building. Christ does that for all who build their lives on Him. And through, and though the world will reject us, 
You can see that from this, from the problems this, these congregations faced. It's common to the church. Though the world will reject us, we will never be disappointed. Not so those builders who rejected the, the great and glorious stone. They left it lying around. That seems to be the picture that's given by the prophet and stumbled over it. That's how Peter described those who rejected Christ in verse 8, the cornerstone, which is a blessing for believers, is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense for unbelievers. Now that's a quote, his next Old Testament quote from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14 where the prophet states that the Lord will be a sanctuary for those who follow Him, but the reason for a fall and destruction for those who reject Him. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to the disobedient. Isaiah meant that that for both of the houses of Israel, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, Peter here applied that to the unbelievers of his day, Jews and Gentiles, and then explained that they stumbled because they are disobedient to the Word. Now, Peter was not writing to unbelievers. He was writing to believers. And he wrote this to encourage them. So you might wonder, well, how does the the stumbling of the unbeliever and the destruction of the unbeliever, how would that be an encouragement? Well, the reality is, as he's explaining here, all that happened, everything that happened at the cross and as a result in their own lives, all of that was part of God's all-wise plan the rejection of Christ and the world's hostility that surrounded these churches was not unforeseen. It was predicted centuries earlier by Isaiah. That's that's the nature of life in a fallen world. In this world of darkness, the sons of darkness are against the children of light. But Peter also said, it's not only prophesied, but planned. The New American Standard Bible translates the verse, to this doom they were appointed. Doom is added as an explanation for the pronoun this. What is the this? To this they were appointed. And so the translators and the editors interpreted that as to their doom, their ultimate destruction. That's possible. That's a possible interpretation. The English Standard Version puts, they stumble because they disobey, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do, in which case what's preordained is their stumbling, their unbelief. So either one could be true. I think that the second, the English Standard Version, is probably more harmonious with the context. Here's the point. The rejection of Christ was not only prophesied, it was ordained. God is absolutely sovereign over the souls of men. And He has a purpose for their unbelief. Human unbelief and rebellion are not outside of God's absolute control outside of His plan. They are part of it. They are within the plan of God. And there are other verses of Scripture that teach that very thing. Uh, very significantly in regard to the rejection of Christ by His own people, Israel, we have numerous examples of that. It was part of God's plan, as I say. And Peter made that very point on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 23. And then the church in Acts chapter 4, verse 28, made the same point that the cross was ordained. The most heinous crime in history is described as being predestined by God. 
on the day of Pentecost, Peter said to his audience, you nailed to a cross and put to death Christ by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. And here he wrote that. And obviously, the cross, the crucifixion, which is the very means of our salvation, the remedy for sin and guilt, was planned and ordained by God from all eternity. It was the cup that he gave his son to drink. That doesn't in any way mitigate, lighten the guilt of those who carried out the crucifixion. They rejected Christ freely. They rejected him deliberately, willingly, knowingly, knowing that he was innocent. They disobeyed God's word. It's the same here. There is a, a warning in that for all those who reject Christ. They are stumbling over the rock. They are stumbling over the stone, the Savior, to their eternal destruction. Now, did that mean that these unbelievers couldn't repent? Many did on the day of Pentecost. Did we read that in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, that about 3,000 souls afflicted themselves, repented, believed. And then later in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, there's this amazing statement that a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. You'd like to read more about that. Many of the priests came to faith in Christ by the grace of God. So there was hope for the pagans as well, then and now. But Peter intended this text to be encouragement to the beleaguered churches. All of this fit within God's good and sovereign plan just as the crucifixion did, to bring good out of it, and he would do that, just as he will do that in your life in the difficulties that you face at this present time, or you will come to face. God is in control and will bring good out of it. In fact, he had already blessed these saints greatly, and Peter gets back to their, their blessings in verse 9 with the, the, the happier side of... God's sovereignty, the doctrine of election, that and more. But you, he wrote, that is, in contrast to the, the disobedient unbelievers, you are a chosen race. This is the fourth time the word chosen has been used in this letter. We're halfway through chapter 2, and four times he has, Peter has talked about election. Peter was not embarrassed by the doctrine of divine election. If you are, I'm sorry. Peter accepted the fact of it, and he recognized the blessing of it. Chosen people has always described God's people. It was used of Israel. In Isaiah 43, verse 20, God called Israel, my chosen people. And then he, in the next verse, he explained his meaning, the people whom I form for myself. They are God's work of grace. And in the same, it's the same for the church. Christians are, are like Israel in that we have been chosen by God in the same way unconditionally. He formed us for Himself. So who are you? Well, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a chosen one. Chosen by the sovereign grace of God and His unimaginable infinite love. Now does that mean the church is the new Israel? or spiritual Israel. We're not called that. Galatians chapter 6, verse 16 is addressed to believing Jews, not Gentiles. That's the one verse that people often point to. It's not calling the church 
the Israel of God. He's speaking of those within the church, Jews. They are the true Israel of God. And it doesn't mean that we have replaced Israel. Romans 11 is clear that there is a future for ethnic Israel. That it has been largely broken off from the tree of blessing, the olive tree, but that it will be grafted in again. Peter uses this terminology here of the church because the functions Israel performed in the Old Testament, the church does today, yet, yet in a far greater way. In, in the future, according to Romans 11, verses 14 and 15, God will save Israel and use the nation again to bless the whole world. In the meantime, unbelieving Israel has been removed from the place of blessing, as Paul put it, branches broken off from the olive tree, and Christians, mostly believing Gentiles, have been grafted in. So the nation Israel, as the apple of God's eye, has not been replaced by the church. In fact, I think it's more accurate to say that the church Believers have been incorporated into Israel. We are wild branches in their tree, partaking, Paul wrote, of the rich root of the olive tree. Someday, Paul wrote in verse 26, all Israel will be saved. And we will inherit, we Christians, we Gentile believers, our Jewish believers, we will inherit their blessings with them. In the meantime, the nation has been set aside in unbelief and God is working through the church, His chosen people, a chosen race. We are the objects of His grace. We are the object of His loving initiative. We are a royal priesthood. Just as we are living stones in God's temple because of our connection to Christ, we are a royal priesthood due to our connection with Christ, our King and Priest. That's one of the, the great truths that was recovered in the Reformation. The priesthood of all believers. All believers. Luther and others didn't invent that. They recovered it. It's found elsewhere in the New Testament and Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, Christ has made us a kingdom, priests to His God and Father. And that is one of Peter's main lessons here in chapter 2. We are priests. In Luther's day, it was a revolutionary thing, a revolutionary thought. Again, he didn't invent it. Calvin didn't invent it. The Reformers didn't invent it. They recovered it. And, and in doing that, it was a, a liberating discovery. It freed men from the hierarchy of priests who claimed to dispense salvation and were claimed to be mediators between man and God. Christ is the only mediator between God and man. That's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. It can't be argued against. The only mediator. And we're in Christ. If we're believers in Him, the priestly ministry of Levi ended with the Old Covenant when it ended. Now all believers are priests and enter God's presence at any time. That's an amazing thing. We can go into the throne of grace with our prayers and our offerings any time of the day without any hesitation. We're priests. We all have spiritual gifts, not the same gifts. Some are evangelists. Others are teachers. Some exhort. Others have a special gift of mercy. But all of us are gifted in one way or another, and all of us are priests. All believers, male and female, are equally endowed with the Holy Spirit, sealed with the Spirit. He dwells within us, and we have access to God and the freedom to approach Him in prayer with confidence 
absolute confidence with boldness, as the author of Hebrews puts it, night and day, always. So, we should be doing that. Being priests to one another with encouragement and counsel, with instruction and prayer. That's our priestly function in the body of Christ. And as Christ's body and priests, we function in our worship together, taking the Lord's Supper. That's very important to Christ. He said, do this in remembrance of me. That is part of our priestly function and, and essential for spiritual growth and, and love for Him who gave Himself for us. We do it out of love for Him. And we do it out of necessity because it is essential that we be regularly reminded of who we are in Him and what He has done for us. And we do it together. It's part of being a chosen race, a holy nation, and His possession. We are privileged above all people on earth. But that privilege comes with responsibility. Because as God's priests and as God's possession, we are to proclaim the excellencies of Him. That, that is what Israel was to have done. That's what the Lord said in Isaiah 43, verse 21. They are His chosen people. People He had formed for Himself. And He said, they will declare My praise. That was their task, their purpose in life. They had much to praise Him for. You review their history. You see nothing but the hand of God's grace on them. Everything they had was a gift of His sovereign grace. Moses told them in, in Deuteronomy chapter 7 that God set His love on them and chose them above all of the nations. Not because they were great, they were not. They were the smallest. They were the fewest of the nations. In fact, we go back to the choice. It's Abraham. One. Two with Sarah at the most. They were the smallest, the fewest. He chose them, not because of anything in them, not because of their greatness. He chose them because He loved them. That's what Moses told them. They were debtors to mercy alone. Their whole history was one of blessing. Sovereign, merciful, gracious blessing. He saved them out of slavery in Egypt and destroyed their oppressors. He gave them the land of Canaan with splendid cities that they did not build and fruitful vineyards that they did not plant. All a gift. He gave them the law and the prophets, the temple and the sacrifices, the light of God's truth for the nations, the Gentiles, the simple gospel in the promise of the Messiah and Redeemer to come. Those are great gifts that He gave to Israel, but Israel never declared God's praise. Not fully as a nation. At best, only a remnant was faithful. Someday they will be grafted back into the olive tree. Then the prophecy of Isaiah 43, verse 21 will be fulfilled. But that is what we are to do now. And we have those excellencies revealed right here in verse 9. The God they were to praise is the one who called them, these Gentile believers scattered throughout Asia Minor, these churches all over that continent, called them out of darkness into His marvelous light. Out of darkness. Out of ignorance. Which darkness represents represents many things. Ignorance, corruption. He called them out of corruption of all kinds, harmful and self-destructive practices, sins. He called them out of Satan's realm, which is a realm of darkness, 
from all of his oppressive slavery. That's grace. In fact, that's Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. God rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom he added, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We were rescued. Not one of them, not one of us, is any better than those of verse 8, who stumble over Christ, the cornerstone. What distinguishes us is grace, unmerited, undeserved favor. That's what Peter celebrated in verse 10 by quoting Hosea. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. All the privileges we have, and Peter has recorded here, being a chosen race, being a royal priesthood, God's people, God's possession. Imagine that He'd want us as His possession, as His inheritance. That's what we are. All of that, all of it is due to God's undeserved favor. His infinite, eternal love. We had a great picture of that in Luke 15, the parable of the prodigal son that Mark taught this morning, of God's love for us. It's amazing love beyond our comprehension. Now, these people, Gentiles mostly, previously pagans, had no claim on any of these privileges. They were not His people. They were far away. They were lost in the darkness when He called them out of that darkness and into the light. That's every believer. And the more we understand that, the more we will want to do what we are to do. Proclaim it to those around us. God's undeserved, omnipotent mercy and sovereign grace. Our problem is, we really don't understand the depth of the darkness out of which we have all been called. That's why grace means nothing to the natural man, and unfortunately, very little to many of God's people. We are inured to sin. It is so common around us and we've become so used to it that we, 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 have, uh, we, we receive it, as it were. We tolerate it. We're accustomed to it. So, because of that, I, I, I come back to the medieval theologian Anselm who explained the, the problem in his book, Why God Became Man. His partner in debate couldn't see why Christ's incarnation and death were necessary for salvation. Why did that have to happen? It's not necessary. Just repent. Just turn. Just believe. Anselm stated his problem. You have not yet considered the greatness of the weight of sin. And that's everyone's problem. When we do, and we understand that, we know that not only by the death of Christ's Son become man, could the debt we owe be paid off in any other way. And it's paid off in full. Only He could do that. And then, when we know that, we acknowledge His mercy. Gladly acknowledge His mercy. Because then, knowing that, we know who we are. Sinners saved by grace and greatly privileged. We are God's temple. Who are you? God's temple. Who are you? God's priests and debtors to mercy alone. I, I think the parents of T.E. Lawrence understood that. 
just before the outbreak of the First World War, his father wrote a letter to his five sons to be opened upon his death. It disclosed a family secret. He had been married before he met their mother. She was a governess in their home when, unfortunately, as he put it, they fell in love. He abandoned his wife, he abandoned his family to start a new family, a new life. He called it a cruel fact, knew it would cause them great sorrow, but he wanted them to learn from his and their mother's mistake. He wrote, There was never a truer saying than, The ways of transgressors are hard. He concluded, But I say most distinctly that there is no happiness in life except you abide in Him through Christ. And oh, I hope you all will. Well, it seems one of the five brothers did. He became a medical missionary in China. Lawrence became a soldier, a national hero, an international celebrity, dying at the age of 46 on his motorcycle. He had fame, but not the happiness in life that his father said is only ours through Christ. Fame is fleeting, but happiness in Christ is forever. And he who believes in Him will not be disappointed. Have you believed in Him? Then you have entered a life that will not be a disappointment. But remember, this life is not easy. This life you've entered into is like the life that these saints that Peter wrote to had entered into. A life of difficulty. A life of challenges. We are in a spiritual war and it is a hot war. And it will be so to the day of our death. That's the reality. But you are a priest of God in the midst of it. We are a priest and we have great responsibilities and we have the grace of God to support us. So proclaim His excellencies. Proclaim His grace and mercy. Live it before others. Live out the glory and the power that is yours in Christ. May God help you to do that. Help all of us to be faithful to our responsibilities and our ministry. But if you've not believed in Him, you are invited to come to Him and come to Him in the only way anyone can. And that's through faith. By knowing that He is God's Son who came into this world, became a man in order to represent sinners and bear the penalty of their sin. He has done that. And all who believe in Him, come to Him through faith, are saved. So may God help you to trust in Him and then live for Him. Well, let's stand and sing number 15 in the Songs of Praise book. I hope I got the uh, song number right this week. Number 15, A Debtor to Mercy Alone. Father, we do thank You for that mercy. Man, what a great thought that our names are written on the palms of His hands. All He came to die for, multitudes beyond number. He saved. He paid the price. He made the atonement that was necessary. He satisfied Your justice. And now through faith and faith alone, which You give by Your sovereign grace, we come to Him and to the forgiveness of sins and the righteousness that's in Christ and we're Your children forever with a glorious inheritance and a secure present. In the now, we are secure regardless 
of the difficulties of life. Whether it has to do with employment or health, whatever. The strife that we go through, you're in control. And you're going to see us through the storm. We give you praise and thanks for that. That's the encouragement Peter gave to those ancient Christians in that troubled land of Asia Minor. And it's true for us today in this place. We thank you for that. Thank you for your mercy. We thank you for Christ and his death for us. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you shalom, peace. In Christ's name, amen.